Oh, to my right is the artist Judy Baca. Uh, next to her is Alexander Gabriel, who is director of uh, the gallery uh, Fortis Dalio and Gabriela in Sao Paulo and in Rio. Then Julia Halperin, who is the executive editor of Artnet News, and Magali Ariola, who is an independent curator at the moment, but has been a curator at Humex and the Tamayo and a number of other places. So most of you are probably here because you have heard of Pacific Standard Time, LA, LA. But for those who are not that familiar, it's the largest project ever done on Latin American and Latino art with 86 museum exhibitions stretching from San Diego up to Santa Barbara and Los Angeles out to Palm Springs and over 100 private gallery exhibitions. So jumping right in, uh, doing a project like this at this moment in our history and politics, Judy, um, you not only are an artist but an activist, uh, what do you see as the intervention of Pacific Standard Time at this moment? Well, it's a, a kind of profound, actually I'm thinking a bit of the firestorm, right? We're in the midst of a firestorm in Los Angeles and all of us are dealing with who is burning where and it's pretty terrifying. Um, but actually the Pacific Standard Time, uh, LA, LA, is a bit of a firestorm. It's uh, 80 exhibitions so that at this particular moment across the city, there is the presence of Latino artists in a way that has never occurred in our history. And there, that one cannot underestimate the power of that, of this particular moment. Uh, but I'd say lasting impact is really the issue. Will this be a temporary fix? Will we see ourselves as the, um, the Latinos as a sort of add-on? And, and, and I, I have to say that What's very important to recognize is that Los Angeles is a Mexican city. It's not necessarily a Latino city. And I think there's a confusion about that very often in terms of how things are perceived. And the curators uh, initially who were putting up exhibitions uh, were struggling against Chicano presence within those exhibitions. So there was a, a lot of a kind of a, uh, a beginning of conflict as we, we went back and forth with these uh, curators developing the exhibitions. Uh, but a Chicano presence became uh, a pretty profound through many of the exhibitions. But what I want to say is that the most important impact of this series of exhibitions are its publications. Um, there's something like 50 books. Is that right, Andrew? Yes. There, there'll be something like 50 pieces of scholarship. And it's very, uh, for example, the Radical Women's Show is bringing to the foreground at the hammer women that have probably never been seen before or heard from before. And this will provide a resource that is really deep and rich. And I think that um, the other problem was, of course, through the whole uh, history of, of this, uh, the development of this exhibition, was the resources that were spent and distributed among various uh, museums and organizations. And, um, the organizations that had historically, uh, like my own, for example, um, the Social and Public Art Resource Center, have been historically presenting Latino art over 40 years, uh, were not necessarily part of this mix in terms of the presentation. So there was also sort of an um, uh, equal distribution of resources, unequal uh, distribution of resources to, to mount these shows. In some cases, uh, people had, uh, curators had two years and deep research and we're able to you know, do a really profound set of, uh, of uh, digging into providing new information. Uh, but I think one of the big questions for us is how will this change? How will this make our city a different place? And how will this, in a sense, I feel a kind of moment of speaking back to a country 
that is, uh, has a very uneasy relationship to its population, both immigrant and those of us who are uh, angelitos to the core. So, Julia, um, quite a bit of the press, there was a big article, for instance, in The Guardian that called Pacific Standard Time the anti-Trump project. What have you seen about the uh, critical response to the, the project and its political impact? Well, I think it was, that was really the like first line that everybody came away with was it was this, this sort of, this moment of building bridges instead of building walls. And, uh, and I think it, it's interesting because obviously this project was planned long before Trump was elected. It was, you know, the first proposals were made, I think, in the first grants were made in 2013. And so, you know, the, the sort of original, like, you know, intellectual rigor behind this was all happening beforehand. So I think it's, in some ways, it, it, you know, it felt incredibly vital and it felt, you know, I think that it did encourage people who maybe, you know, wouldn't have made it a priority to come immediately to really get there and see it. Um, but I also, I feel kind of conflicted about it because I also don't want it to kind of oversimplify the fact that this would have been important whether Trump was in office or not. Uh, and it would have been addressing, you know, absences in, in history and in art history, whether he were in office or not. So I'm, I feel kind of conflicted about it, but I do think that it succeeded in making, uh, in, in kind of making it spread more quickly than, you know, and, than, and wider than it might have otherwise. I think that the, the sort of international press attention was, was really intense in a way that was really exciting. And I was on the press trip to Pacific Standard Time and, um, and we were there with a lot of, you know, Mexican journalists and, uh, and, and other Latin American journalists and the, a couple of journalists from the Mexican newspapers, there was such great demand for coverage of this that they had like three deadlines a day, uh, which is That's great. very, you know, it is not ordinary. And so I think that there, yeah, there was a lot more hunger maybe for, to get this than there would have been otherwise. So McGill with Judy talking about uh, LA, which is very true as a Mexican, Mexican-American city, and what Julia, what has been the reaction to the project in Mexico? I think uh, as both Julia and, and Judy said, it's like, like a very important and instrumental project in the sense that first of all, it allowed to, to do like tons of research that hasn't probably been done, at least, you know, like, Probably in Mexico, uh, there's like many, many... Not even many in our own countries. I mean, I, I think so. anywhere like in Latin America. Countries like, uh, yeah. maybe, you know, like Argentina. I think Brazil has done, you know, like a good coverage of their, like, historical background. But there's like many, many lacuna in, in Mexican art history that haven't been, you know, like covered. So like very recently, for example, two years ago, there was a, a show of um, Monica Mayer, who is included in the Radical Women show, but it's really something that has just like barely started, you know, in the last maybe three, four years. So, and maybe one of the reasons for that is that we, like, Mexican institutions, for example, didn't collect for a long time. So they didn't do like the proper research or we didn't do, you know, like working inside and outside the, the institutions. There were like very, you know, like seldom people doing this work. So this is probably, you know, like a big help in one sense. On the other side, uh, I think it has to do with what uh, Judy said before. The idea of the context, you know, LA being like a Mexican city, but of course, you know, like the, the Chicano phenomenon is not like quite a Mexican phenomenon. So there's like all these, you know, like very different contexts uh, that you have to uh, take into account. And for sure, I think uh, one of the things that has been said is that this is like, like the whole project, like the, uh, as a whole, you know, like initiative is probably much more um, thought of as a, as a project for American, North American audiences, rather than, you know, like Latin American audiences. And I think this is like a very uh, important, uh, you know, like thing to, to think about. Also, because, you know, like if we talk about migration, of course, you know, like the, um, 
like the implications and the consequences of migration in both countries are very different. So that's also, you know, like something that we have to take in, into account. So, like, if we were, or when we are going to get, you know, like the, all that kind of research back through books and all of this, because not all of, all of the shows are traveling back to Latin America, that's probably something we have to, like, rethink about, I think, in a way. You know, like, how to, how to, what to do with this research and how to work it and how to, you know, like, re kind of implement it, you know, like, because it's been done by, of course, you know, like, Latin American creators, much of it. So that's also something, you know, like, that has gone, I think it's going to have, like, like, larger repercussions, you know, like, in the long term, as soon as we just, like, turn it back into... I agree, yeah. So, Alex, I mean, the Trump phenomenon here is sort of overshadowed politics in much of the rest, but Brazil is going through uh, also a very difficult time, and especially as far as, as art is concerned. Yes, um, I, when I was a kid in the 80s, uh, it, it was still military dictatorship, and I don't remember, and I remember it quite well, but I don't remember living through a situation of censorship like we're going through right now. I mean, there's a, they're trying to close down shows because of nudity. It's not even sex. And, and um, one of the saddest things is to realize how this whole thing is being, you know, art became sort of distraction for the real political problem that we're living through. So uh, they're talking about closing down shows and then at 2 a.m., you know, they are voting for new labor laws in private uh, sessions of uh, the Senate. So it's, um, it's a really dangerous moment that we're going through right now. But one thing I would like to point is that I don't believe that um, the fact that Trump is um, the president now overshadows the quality of what what was presented uh, at PSC, I think it's um, I think it's what it is, and a lot of the work that was presented there, especially um, the period of the 60s and 70s, was produced under uh, military dictatorship in various countries in Latin America, and a lot of this history was never told. Uh, for political reasons, uh, so it's I don't think it's a, only a, a problem of uh, art history, but really of political interest at the time. You know, um, well, and in some ways, the the art in many of the shows is a model of how to resist or how to evade censorship during very difficult political moments. Yeah, and somehow I think I can only, I'm not an art historian, but uh, I can only talk up from a Brazilian perspective, but either in music and literature and the arts, a lot of the poetics that had developed in, in the 60s and 70s was, you know, going, finding, you know, holes in censorship and finding new ways of having the messages delivered and and I think that's a that's a, that became somehow an important element for Brazilian visual arts and arts in in general all of you have talked about the thing that probably sets specific standard time apart from most other museum or exhibition projects which is the length of the research and yeah. uh, and maybe the depth of the research. And Julia, that's something I know you've written about. Do you want to start about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, you know, the, the thing that, that really makes it different is that um, curators had, they had grants for um, research and then they had grants that were called implementation grants. So they had two rounds of grants and you know in some cases three years between them to 
to do research and that meant that they had time to change their mind and in a lot of cases they did. Um, so, you know, for example, the Radical Women show was originally just going to be uh, Latin America and then, you know, through these conversations and through research they decided to include um, Latina and Chicana artists as well. Um, and the home show at LACMA actually went the other direction um, where I think they were, it was originally going to be just uh, Latino and Latina artists, and they decided to expand it out to include um, Latin America. And so, you know, I think it's it's the kind of thing that you that that curators always wish could happen, where they have time to think, okay, this is what I want to do, and then they have the opportunity to research and Question then change their minds. Yeah. Um, and but it's so rarely, you know, you're so constrained both financially and with time that you kind of have to figure out a way to make it work. And so I think. That was something that really shone through a lot in in the rigor of the shows. I think a lot of the geographical uh, boundaries that would set the research in the first case would change. You know, mm -hmm. even the choice for, for instance, the monographic shows, the two Brazilian artists that had museum shows with Valesca Suarez, who's an American citizen, Brazilian-born, and Ana Maria Maiolino, who's born in Italy and is <laughs> Brazilian. Uh, so it's like, I think a lot of this, you know, first geographic labels were, you know, put in a more complex perspective through a, because of the research quality and, and time. And Judy, what, I mean, one of the things that uh, has certainly not been the case for many years is the ability to do, or a lot of research being done on Chicano and Chicana art and the ability to present that to a wide public. Yes, I, I think it's, um, it's interesting because there was uh, in some curatorial resistance, I think there was, there was a lot of talk um, as, uh, um, PST was developing and uh, some grumblings from our communities about how uh, we would be represented or not represented. Um, even to the fact that our opening night there wasn't a one piece of Mexican food in the <laughs> at, at the Getty. Uh, everybody else was represented, but where are the tacos, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so there was a lot of the, that, but what's really, what's really fascinating is that the Chicanos Early on, I mean, thinking about Rupert Garcia and the Borders show, for example, uh, a 1970s work was as relevant today to the other works represented as any other artist. I thought one of the things that was resonant was that um, even though some of it was 60s and 70s, it was absolutely relevant today, uh, absolutely current. So what you were looking at is, I don't know whether it's artists' approaches to the same kind of period or in fact, um, those of us Chicanos, those of us uh, American-born Mexicans have been dealing with the issues of borders, we have been dealing with the issues of migration, we've been dealing with the stories that are um, the American story, essentially a very essential American story for all of our lives. So there was a body of work that started to become clear and evident. Um, I think probably not represented as much as it should have been, uh, because I knew of many other works that could have been within those shows. Um, but I was very pleased to see the quality of the work selected and that there was a kind of resonance throughout them of um, timely, timely work, even though some of it was really historical. So, Miguel, obviously PST doesn't come out of a vacuum. It builds on the work of many others scholars, curators, gallerists who supported artists. Can you talk a little bit about that history and some of the major exhibitions and, and people who really are uh, a precursor to Pacific Standard Time? I think, well, I could only, you know, like speak like more pertinently about the, like the Mexican case. Uh, I would say, of course, you know, like, this would go back to the, probably to the 1980s, you know, like this, when there was like the whole uh, multicultural movement. And of course, 
also when there was like this uh, new kind of impetus from the Mexican government of, you know, like positioning itself in a way as a like cultural machine, uh, which was in 1988. Yes, uh, when they did the, the big show at the Met, the 30, um, 30 centuries of splendor. 300 years. 300, yeah. 30 yes. And uh, so that was like a very particular moment, I would say, which was questioned a lot from Mexico. And I was just like reading, recent, reading recently for some other reason, um, one of the first uh, sessions of the, um, the first FITAC, which was like this uh, big symposium that still continues uh, on contemporary art, which took place in 91. And so Edward Sullivan was part of the, um, of the symposium. And he was actually, it was interesting to see how, again, you know, like this, um, this kind of initiatives are, are seen in a very different manner, you know, like in the US and in Mexico. So Sullivan's position was actually like celebrating, you know, like this kind of initiatives because of course, same thing, you know, like it brings like all of this research together and then it brings out like all of these works that are frequently, you know, like in um, private collections that you wouldn't get to see. And of course you get you know, to articulate in a way a, at least a piece of history. And the reaction in Mexico City by people like Olivier de Broaz and, you know, like these uh, art historians that were like really, um, that did like a, a, like a, maybe, I don't know, Olivier in his case, he probably worked for his whole life, you know, like trying to, to like question this kind of official, you know, like nationalistic narratives and, and just to, of course, you know, like recognize, you know, like what has been done in historical terms, you know, like since, you know, like maybe, like in his case, the early 1920s with the muralists and Rivera and Siqueiros and how that can be framed in a very political manner as a official discourse, but also, you know, like how you can actually turn things upside down and just like turn them into a more uh, critical reading. So I guess that, that was like a very, you know, like uh, important period, like the 80s and 90s both because of these clashes, I would say, you know, like the, there was like a kind of official narrative that then evolved into Neo-Mexicanismo, which is also like very tied to, to identity issues, to gender issues. And then somehow, I think for many reasons, which probably have to do with, uh, I guess, just like contemporary history and political history, you know, like Venezuela just like kind of disappearing off the map. Uh, I guess Mexico also somehow just like turned around, you know, like there was like a very strong relationship with Latin America in the 80s and 90s. And then at some point there was like this sort of hype about Mexican contemporary art. And I think Mexico just like turned around towards the States and Europe. And there was like a kind of, um, I don't know, like a break with uh, the relationship with Latin America, which is like really, like a really interesting phenomenon, like a really sad one too. And I think it's like really just like recently, maybe, you know, like because of um, art fairs, you know, like, and the, of course, you know, like social media and, you know, like the, this kind of accelerated communications played a, a big deal. But I think art fairs have been like really instrumental to build back that kind of relationship between, you know, like the Americas in a way, you know, like Mexico looking again, you know, like southwards and, and just like trying to build, you know, like, uh, like reconstruct these kind of relationships. And Alex, I mean, one of the things that's obvious when you see many of these exhibitions is that it was really the galleries that supported these artists when there really was very little curatorial and other interest. Yeah, um, um, I, I was surprised to, when I got the invitation to be in an art fair under the institutional talk umbrella. That made me happy. Uh, <laughs> And I think, and we were talking about it, um, I think you see uh, in many of the shows, especially during um, this, the 60s and 70s um, period, uh, the importance of some of the galleries that were really brave. Um, I mean, Luisa Strina opened her gallery in 1973 in Sao Paulo, 
and she was working with Sildo Meirelles, with Antonio Manuel, with all this, you know, hardcore political action. And she had to deal with the police a lot <laughs> at the time. So it's, uh, it's really, you know, not what is expected from a gallery in today's uh, perspective. And, but other than that, I think um, uh, there was a, a really interesting movement around uh, PST in between the galleries and doing collaborations like we did with um, Hauser and with Ibid and uh, uh, Kuri Mansutu did with... Um, maybe, maybe talk a little bit... With, with Regan and a lot of, there was a lot of exchange uh, between the Latin American galleries and um, in, in various scales from small galleries and younger artists to very um, uh, renowned artists. And, and that made like a hundred shows, like you said. Like it was, and I think it was a beautiful sort of complement to what was being exhibited at Pacific Standard Time because um, somehow, you know, the, the present moment was more, you know, in the galleries and in many, uh, in many different ways, too, which I think it's also interesting um, because uh, only an event uh, in that scale can actually um, uh, speak about, you know, the, the variety of what's, uh, un what's under Latin American art. You know, it's so huge, you know, what is Latin American art in, you know, you have the historical perspective, you have, uh, as you were saying, the, the national, you know, um, stories that have been told in many different ways and through, throughout the years. And, and you have right now, you have a lot of young artists who have sometimes very little uh, connection to uh, local issues, you know? And, and I think that was all represented uh, between PST and the gallery shows. And that gives you uh, a different kind of um, rapport to what you can, you know, put under this label. I mean, one of the things you just mentioned, I think, is one of the justifications, I think, for having a project this large and this resource intensive is to see artists work in various contexts. Because no matter how great an individual exhibition is, it could only present the work in one context. And Judy, how do you feel about being, for instance, the context of your solo exhibition versus being in the Radical Women exhibition? Uh, it was, um, I was kind of surprised, although the original PST, uh, the, the same kind of thing happened in Pacific Standard Time, uh, in which I think I was in six of those shows. Um, but the request started to come in one after the other, and I think I, I, I ended up being in four of these exhibitions. And they were quite dramatically different. And one of them actually brought my work from the Smithsonian back to Los Angeles, which was purchased by the um, uh, Latino Treasures collection. And uh, it hadn't been seen in Los Angeles in over 20 years. So um, uh, a piece called the Tres Marias, which is, turns out that when it was originally made almost 40 years ago, uh, it, it posited that there could be a third Maria, right? And the, that was a mirror. And I had no idea that I would have created the perfect selfie site right, 40 years ago. Uh, and that's what happened. And so the, it was very interesting to see um, my tuck and roll triptych, um, you know, using the kind of gang car making, and then also these, these, these figures that were iconic f female figures, have another context and come back to Los Angeles in another time. So there was two aspects of it. It was not only within different contexts, 
but also in different time periods in the time they were created. And that was really fascinating to me. I was like in wonder watching people relate to the work and interact with it. And then also in the Borders show, which was a show really about uh, the, our relationship to border, younger people approaching the border um, in really f fascinating ways and, and different ways. That was really interesting to me. So I was actually learning a tremendous amount watching my work in these different contexts. And I was very pleased that it, they fit in these different places. And it was really the wisdom of the curators and not necessarily mine. So thinking a little bit about what the legacy of Pacific Standard Time is going to be, I and mean, Alex, I think you have five artists in different Pacific... Okay, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how you see this impacting their careers. Well, I think um, we have four artists in the museum shows with uh, one solo show and one, two, three, blah, 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 ten, seven, and five group shows, two solo shows in, in galleries. And of course, with a... Uh, with the PR and the promotion that you have to all of these shows, this is really important to them and to us. But most of all, I think uh, the legacy, it's really, uh, as I was saying before, a change in the perception of what can be Brazilian art, what can be Latin American art, and making that a much more, you know, broad and sophisticated look and not just one drawer that you can, you know, file all of, um, all of them together. And Magali, what, as a curator, what do you see as the legacy of the project? I think, um, like, those two positions are really, really important. Um, of course, you know, like as Alex said, there is certainly a, a generational issue where like younger artists are probably not that much yeah. interested anymore in just like being branded as a Brazilian or Mexican or and again you know like particularly in Mexico we had like those you know like years in the early 2000s where we had like one after another after another like all these uh, shows about Mexico which had like a, a great impact um, I think in the artists' careers and, and the way they started working, because of course, you know, like, at the beginning, you know, like, everyone was excited to be, you know, like, picked by, say, Klaus Biesenbach and then show their work in PS1 and Kunstwerke, because of course, you know, like, that was like a first step for um, their careers to take over. But then at the same time, there was like this crazy, you know, like, will of being there and not being there and being there and not being labeled as a Mexican artist, but like building a career. And of course, you know, like many of them, and that's a reality, were working with, you know, like very specific issues uh, related to the context. But that doesn't mean that you then have to, you know, like just, uh, uh, comply with the expectations of, and, and that was what happened at some point. So of course, you know, like after a few years, I think people were just like, you know, I'm not gonna be part of this, so. And, and it's probably like a kind of, how do you say that, like initiation, right, that we had to go through, you know, like, and, and it was like a very tough moment, you know, like in Mexico, because it was like very, you know, like, it created like all sorts of stories, and you know, like people were like really, you know, as we know in Mexico, people can be like very, you know, like tough in the reactions and stuff. But then, you know, like of course, after a while, that was like really, uh, I think it was like a very important step for, for just like people to take over. And of course there's, you know, like all these, um, what Judy was saying is like the fact that their work after that could be, you know, like contextualized in very different manners and very different, you know, like institutions and, and stuff, that, that's what really made, made a change. So I think this is probably, you know, like in terms of legacy, this is like a very, kind of necessary, you know, like, step to go through, you know. And I, it, this really happened as waves sometimes, you know, like, especially within the market. I mean, being Brazilian was much cooler six years ago. You know what I mean? It's like, if you're stick to these things, you're, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah. 
So, um, since we're at an art fair, and the, the main reason for PST is we've all been talking about is the research, the scholarship, the publications, the legacy, but it's undeniable that the first one had a major, the first Pacific Center of Time had a major impact on the market. And Julia, I was wondering if you could speculate a little bit on what uh, impact this one is gonna have. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about it. I mean, I think it's gonna be a little bit less direct than the first one. I remember right after the first one, Christopher Knight wrote in the LA Times that it was, that it served as like an inadvertent shopping list uh, to assemble like an amazing, you know, post-war collection of, of California art. I don't, I don't think it's the same, first because it's so sprawling and also because a lot of this work is, you know, ephemeral or, or ephemera um, more than maybe the first one. Um, but I do think, you know, I, I have often come back to uh, thinking about what a couple of professors of Latino and Latin American art told me before PST, which was that, you know, a lot of what we have seen in the past is um, work that had strong collector support. So it came from countries where there were rich collectors. And so you saw less, um, you know, work from Peru, from Chile, from, and you saw also less Latino and Chicano art because there just hasn't been that kind of, um, of support in the market. And so I think what this does do is show that, you know, you're not, we're not seeing that stuff because it doesn't exist. We're not seeing that stuff because there are sort of structural reasons why. And so if this can show people, you know, there are artists there that you should look at. And, and, and I think, you know, if that has a, a sort of market reverberation too, that's, that's a good thing. Well, I think we've reached the point where we should open it up and hear from the audience. So, uh, any questions? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Judy Holm, president of the Global Fine Art Awards, and I, I love following all of your work. And having recently left Miami, being from California, and being very concerned and involved with the global art world, or community as I prefer to call it, I, I do have a question regarding the future of having perhaps some of the exhibitions travel, and in particular with the strong, often referred to as capital of Latin America here in Miami. Have any of you considered reaching out or creating wave two, perhaps, of, of some of the beautiful work that you've created in California? Yeah, quite a, for the first Pacific Standard Time, we really wanted people to travel to Los Angeles because that was not something that uh, people did as much as they came to New York or London or sh even Chicago. Um, and so we didn't really encourage shows to travel. In this case, and in particularly because it's a dialogue between Latino, Chicano, Latin American art, um, there was much more encouragement and a great many of the shows are traveling. The um, one personal sadness is not as many of them are traveling to Latin America as um, I would have hoped. I mean, there, there are some memories of underdevelopment uh, is going to uh, Museo Humex and uh, Museo de Arte de Lima, um, the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo is taking the Radical Women show. But partially, of course, the economic situation and a lot of... Some of them well, canceled, no? Yeah. Some of them, I don't know if canceled, but didn't go all yeah. the way through. And, um, you know, that that's something that uh, I hope in the future, I mean, the good part was that almost every project had curators and scholars from Latin America involved in it. 
the the less good pro part is that uh, not as many people in many of these countries will, but the shows are traveling very widely in the United States. Hello, thank all of you. Um, and PST is amazing. I didn't get to spend enough time there. Uh, I'm Josh Franco. I'm the National Collector at the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian. Um, and Judy, there were tacos at the DC reception for PST, <laughs> and it was at the Mexican Cultural Institute, so it was beautiful and very Mexican. Um, but I was struck by something, Magali, that you said about the, um, the artists not being so concerned with their national identifications in, you know, in the script of their whatever show they're in. Um, and I think that's interesting because what I've seen from PST for thinking only about Chicanos and US brown people is the like total upswing in the like taking on of the pigeonholing, what's been called pigeonholing in the identity. So I think of a lot of the art, you know, Beatriz Cortez or Rafa Esparza, who like, if you follow them on Instagram, it's I'm brown, I'm brown, I'm Chicano, I'm Chicano. Like, please, myself, you know, I'm a Chicano art historian. I'm very happy to be, reside in that pigeonhole. Um, so I wonder, you know, I don't want to make a monolith of US and Latin America, but I just, you know, maybe you have something to say, or maybe, you know, Julia and Judy, you have something to think this trajectory of Chicano willingness to take it on over time. And I just think back less than a decade ago to Phantom Sightings when the whole crux of that show was the crisis. And all, the artists, like, it was hard to get those artists to even be in that show because it was <laughs> as much distance as the curators put to Chicano. It was too much for a lot of them. Um, so I'm just interested in how you think PST will affect that moving forward. Yeah. I don't think I'm, you know, like, the most uh, adequate person to talk about Chicanos because, again, you know, like, maybe this answers your question, you know, like, I'm from Mexico. And I think, as I said at the very beginning, you know, like, all these um, issues of migration, I think it's really, it's really interesting to see how, how they just like take different dimensions, you know, like on each side of the border. Because if we talk about, you know, like migration, say from Mexico, and of course you can go south, you know, like Central America, and which, you know, like I'm sure that the issues are very similar. What that means, or like even, you know, like Ecuador, you know, like what that means in Oaxaca or those, you know, like very poor countries is that you know, like many of the men are gone. So it's less about identity issues than, you know, like much more practical concerns. Whereas, of course, as soon as you get north of the border, that's, that's what becomes the, the, the main issue. Even so more, you know, like when you get like different generations, you know, of uh, Latinos and Chicanos and, you know, like many of them, you know, like I'm very good friends with Rita and I remember when she did the Phantom sightings, you know, like talking at length with her. And uh, because her show came to the Tamayo afterwards, after uh, LACMA. And so she was like really worried again, you know, like on, about how to contextualize it. And I was just like, I'm absolutely clueless, you know. I didn't, I, I just, at that point I had just moved to, to Los Angeles from Mexico City. So I wasn't like really, you know, like uh, acquainted with the, the LA scene at that point. But I was just telling her, you know, like this is like an absolutely new phenomena for me because we don't, we're absolutely not in contact, you know, like with, Chiqui, with Chicanos in, in, in Mexico City to start with, you know, because it's like a big, you know, like urban setting and, you know, like maybe, you know, like not maybe, but I'm sure, you know, like most of, you know, like the, the migrant population doesn't come from big cities, you know, it really comes from rural areas. And then of course, you know, like they, their lives completely transformed once they are in the States. So it's really, you know, like, I think it's like two different, um, like completely different um, visions in a way. And, and again, you know, like migration, you know, like for like south of the border is like, uh, I think it's really like a very, it, it implies like very different um, issues and consequences. Judy, I think I should give you the last word on, on this. And migration, yes. Um, well, you're talking about the lasting impact and also this issue of um, the perception on both sides of the border. There has been historically a really difficult um, uh, relationship between uh, Mexicanos and Chicanos, uh, both art historically, because 
um, there was a, a tendency, the shows that, the, I, I just use myself as an example because I think uh, Chicano art crosses a lot of, it's multifaceted and it crosses a lot of different territories. And in the sh a piece that I, I created this, uh, Tres uh, Panchos, that are um, three different figures, they're, they're Mexican kitsch objects that I've intervened with. And that was in the border show. And it was in the, uh, it was called uh, El Otro Mexico. The show was called El Otro Mexico and it traveled for five years. In Mexico, they were absolutely demeaned. Um, the writers said that it belonged on the street. And I said, yes, it does actually. It's from the street. And it belongs in the museum as well, right? So this kind of uh, relationship is, I think, not understanding, not being communicating, not communicating, I think is one of the issues that's really a fascinating legacy going forward. Because one of the shows that I think needs to happen is the relationship between historic uh, Mexican muralism and the new muralists of, of the United States. And what we have done with that legacy and how it's transformed. Uh, n not only in my work, but in many people's work. And one of the shows that I really wanted to do was to bring a show from Oaxaca, for example, on uh, uh, those artists who were creating giant walls and look at how they were influenced by Chicanos. It's fascinating, it's so profound. So that it, for many years you would say that the influence came from the other direction, that we were uh, disembodied Mexicans from our, from our home country, but in truth, in, in a sense, there is no border. That's a fluid line. I mean, that line doesn't really exist. Like, you know, birds and water move across it. And I think actually our art should be a way that we bridge that, that border and that it disappears, in a sense, culturally and uh, psychologically. Well, I feel like we just got started, but unfortunately we're out of time. So please join me in thanking the four panelists for a terrific conversation. Thank you.